Death is not easy to talk about, but what if we've been looking at it all wrong, right? Like a butterfly can't live until the caterpillar dies in the cocoon. Death is a conversion. Well, because of Easter, because of Jesus, death is no longer an ending for us. It's a transition to greater life. Jesus died so that we can live. This is love. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to week two of This Is Love. Uh, the title today is This Is Love. It's a love that conquers death. Today, we continue that series we started last week on Easter, and we're talking about how the resurrection changed everything. You know, last week, we talked about how uh, that because of the resurrection, we know what the cross is all about. Because of Easter, we can understand the meaning and the weight of Good Friday. Because at the cross, Jesus died in our place for our sins. He entered into our pain and our shame. Jesus took the weight of evil itself so its power could be broken over us. And because Jesus didn't stay in the grave, we see that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is God in his love freeing us from sin. It is God in his love overcoming death. It is God in his love that announced he was in his love announcing that one day a new creation will come. You see, it's because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we see the love of God. And when we look at Jesus, we can truly say this is love. That's where our title to our series comes from. You know, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, how the resurrection of Jesus is really about God conquering death. Uh, you know, death is the great tragedy of the human experience. The fear of all fears is what? It's, it's of dying. It's of death. Sociologists have observed that just about every society <clears throat> excuse me, has its own version of immortality symbols. Things that give us assurance of living forever. See, in ancient times, it was probably about, or not probably, but it was, it was about being properly enshrined or buried among the gods. Think of things like Pharaoh in Egypt and the Taj Mahal in India. That'll give you a picture of what I'm talking about. But see, the difference between us and them is here and here in America and many other countries today, it's about big houses, fast cars, uh, you know, a big trust fund and retirement accounts, things that we think will live on long after us. It's kind of that idea that we want to make a name for ourselves. We want to leave our mark that when we're gone, we hope and pray that our legacy uh, will continue on. Carry on the family name or carry on the, the family business. And, you know, most of these things are not bad things, right? Most of them may even have decent um, motivations. You know, I think maybe some people are trying to leave uh, their mark on the world to leave it a better place than it was while they were here. But, you know, as far as being immortality symbols, you know, something that that uh, makes us live, uh, uh, live on after death, they come woefully short. Death is the great ending. It's the great finality. It's the inescapable curtain call. So, you know, when Jesus went to the cross on Friday, it was anything but good. His followers were devastated. The dream was over. Like the disciples on the road to Emmaus said uh, that they had hoped that he would be the Messiah. But now their hope had ended. Their heads were hung low. Their bodies were, were they felt lifeless. Their hearts felt hollow. Their eyes were swollen from all the crying and the weeping. How could this be? How could this have happened? You know, death really is the end of all possibilities. If there is no answer for death, 
then all other answers don't really matter, then do they? What then can, can, can it be that has the power to lift our weary heads in this world? Love can. That's the, that's the magic ingredient. Love is as strong as death, if not stronger. It's stronger than death. And on that first Easter morning, God the Father showed the world that there is a love that is stronger than death. When we look at the preaching of, of the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts and, and in Paul's writing, he makes a point in those, in those uh, chapters, in those books, it makes a point to say that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And it matters so much because we are not meant to see Jesus as some sort of, of human or, or Superman kind of figure brought to the brink of death from some villain, right? Some evil villain uh, who somehow musters the, the last bit of strength or life to burst free. That's not how we're supposed to view Jesus. The gospel writers and, and the first preachers of Jesus want us to know that Jesus did really and truly die. That he was buried and he was fully dead. He experienced death. But the amazing thing is God the Father did not abandon his beloved son in the grave. Amen. He vindicates his faithful obedience and sacrificial death by raising him up to a new life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Here's a few ways that the New Testament says it. Uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 31, Peter says it this way. This is the New Living, or the New International Version, the NIV. That's all my passages today will be from the NIV. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 31. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. Paul expanded on this in Acts chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. He said this, he said, We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessing promised to David. So it is also said elsewhere, stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He died and was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But verse 37 says, but the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. They're talking about Jesus. You know, Paul would develop this even further in his letters to the churches that he either started or was trying to encourage because Paul truly understood what we said last week, that the resurrection of Jesus was not just good news for Jesus. It was good news for the whole world. Amen. It's good news for everybody. But some some Christians in the Corinth church weren't very sure. They wondered if all this was really necessary to believe. Couldn't they just say that Jesus was a good teacher and that he was uh, still spiritually here? Why did it matter if he had actually been raised from the dead? And, you know, these questions I, I see in, in, in these passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to turn there with me, that's where our main passage is going to be today. But, but I can see that these questions brought about some of Paul's closest and clearest teaching on the resurrection. And, and I want us to take a closer look at those today. And I want to make three really big observations from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, let's first read verses 20 through 26 in the NIV. It says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also, or comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, 
authority and power for he must re, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. I believe Paul is trying to tell us three very big things here. And the first one is this. Write this down. Um, look in your in the comments to uh, or in the description to this video, to this this uh, service, and you'll see an outline. But uh, the first thing that Paul's trying to tell us is this, that resurrection is the defeat of death. Paul calls death an enemy. And let us be very clear about this. Listen, death is not a friend. Death is not something to be wished for. Death is not a doorway into eternity. Death is a beast. It's an enemy. A lot of times we, we wish to be dead, but, but that's not the right thing to wish for because in Christ we are alive. Death is an enemy. But it's an enemy that will be destroyed, that is destroyed because of Jesus' victory over death on Easter. Can you imagine being free from the fear of death in your life right now? Think about how much fear is related to the fear of death and its finality. We fear so much about those things. But what if? Church, what if we could look the monster square in the face and imagine the worst scenario possible. I'm not trying to put that evil on you, but imagine the worst scenario possible and say that even that, even death will not be my end because I'm in Christ. Oh man, it's amazing. You know, when power is abused, we see this throughout history, even now it's happening. But when power is abused, the weapon that is wielded is the fear of death. Think of tyrants and thieves and rules and di rulers and dictators. They all resort to the ultimate fear, the ultimate threat, and it's the threat of death. But here's the thing. When death no longer has a sting, they no longer have any power over you. That is what happened in the early centuries when, when Caesar after Caesar would threaten to kill Christians if they didn't renounce Christ and follow Caesar. Yet these Christians were free from the fear of death. Why? <laughs> because, <clears throat> excuse me, because they knew they belonged to the one who had conquered death, the one who had been raised up. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We belong to that same one. This is why it's so important that we understand what really happened to Jesus. He did not have a near-death experience and then get resuscitated. He did not pass out on a cross only to be refreshed by the cool air of the tomb. Jesus died. He really died. The piercing in his side, which caused blood and water to flow out, is a medical note on the finality of his death. The disciples were not hallucinating when they saw Jesus. And I think that's why the gospel writers recount stories of the disciples not recognizing Jesus at certain times. There was something familiar, but yet something very different about him. His body seemed to have new, perhaps spiritual properties that allowed him to appear in a room behind locked doors. And yet his body seemed to have the same or similar physical properties that made him hungry and able to eat. And think about it. Even Thomas could now touch his scars and see his wounds. You know, the disciples, they weren't, they weren't using the word resurrection to describe Jesus going to heaven after dying. They have other ways of talking about something like that. When they said he was alive, they didn't mean in their hearts something like we would do at a funeral when we speak of a person living on in our hearts, you know, in our memories. That's not the way they talked. And in the ancient world, they had categories for for spiritual journeys in the afterlife. It was really weird. It's really weird stuff like hallucinations and, and dreams and visions and, and ghosts and all, all these different things. But what happened to Jesus? Let me tell you, man, it shattered every single one of those categories. Every single one of them false ideas. It, it shattered every single one of them. They had no words to describe what happened with Jesus. I mean, he really died and now he's alive. What is going on here? And I think that's why the four Gospels give us somewhat of a differing accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's so many stories and, and so much breathless recounting of something that they really had, 
had no words for. It was so hard to explain. His, there he is. He's different, but he's the same. He's right here in front of us. What's going on? We're in this locked room and all of a sudden, poof, there's Jesus. But I can still touch him. I, I don't understand what's going on. That's what it was like. And, and so by the time Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he can say to them that he is simply the last in, in a long line of witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. If you scroll up to the beginning of that chapter, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verses 3 through 8, it reads like this. He says, For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the disciples. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. There it is. <laughs> And the second thing we can note from, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians about the meaning and the significance of the resurrection is that this, you can fill this in, is that resurrection is God's new beginning when all possibilities have ended. Let me say that again. Resurrection is God's new beginning when all possibilities have ended. I want you to know this morning, church, once again, like we said last week, resurrection is not resuscitation like what happened with, with Lazarus. Resurrection is not a hallucination. Resurrection is not a spiritualization of the afterlife. Resurrection is what only God can bring about when all other possibilities are gone. Do you need resurrection in your life today? What things are dead in your life? What possibilities have ended? Where has the story gone off the rails? Maybe you don't want to talk about those places or those areas in your life because really, hey, what's the point? We fall into that attitude a lot, don't we? How could we possibly change our story anyway? It's over, right? It's a dead end like we talked about last week. Well, that leads me to the third thing I want to talk about this morning that we learned from Paul. If you jump down to, to verse 21 and 22, here it is. That resurrection, fill it in. Resurrection is a gift. Resurrection is a gift. Listen to what Paul wrote. Starting in verse 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. You see, just as death entered the world through one man, so has resurrection life come through the resurrection of one man. Remember what I said earlier and I said last week, it's so important that the resurrection of Jesus is not just good news for Jesus. It is good news for you and me. It's good news for the whole world. What do we do to deserve it? Nothing. What can we do to earn it? Nothing. Resurrection does not emerge from potential Resurrection is not an achievement. No one can raise themselves up from the dead. But here's the thing, church. In Christ shall all be made alive. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you starting to catch why this is such good news? Are you starting to catch why I call it this is love? You know, one day all who are in Christ will be raised up with a glorious new body. We will have bodies like Jesus. You know, we don't know much about what those bodies will be like, but we know that we will seem very similar, yet radically different at the same time, like using the same materials, but it just will have new properties. And all that's wonderful. And that expectation has led Christians for 1,700 years to say the words of the Nicene Creed, which are that we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. But you know what? I want you to know resurrection can begin in you today, right now. I remember the moment, the exact moment, The 
the exact moment that I got saved. The exact moment. And I want to tell you what was going through my head was this isn't happening today. Not today, Jesus. But he did it. He did it anyways. And I want you to know that today, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're facing, resurrection life can begin today. Right now, right where you're at, it can begin. It's so amazing the things that we find in Scripture to encourage us and to prove this. You know, right after uh, uh, writing to the Corinthians about the significance and the meaning of resurrection, Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome this in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He said, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. The Holy Spirit, who with the Father raised Jesus from the dead, is bringing new life to you, can and will bring new life to you right now. The same love that did not abandon Jesus to the grave will never let you go. God says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His love, he loves you with a love that is stronger than death. And then Paul finishes it with this amazing assurance at the bottom of this chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 37 through 39. And he says this, listen to this church. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Man, man, that should raise the hairs on the back of your neck. And in a good way, that's amazing. Praise the Lord. Listen, because Jesus took on death and let it exhaust its power on him, it didn't have to be exhausted on us. It doesn't have to be exhausted on us. Because the Father in his love raised Jesus up from the grave, vindicating his faithfulness and demonstrating his belovedness because of all that. Here's the promise. Here's the assurance for all who are in Christ. Nothing, and I mean nothing, not even death, can separate you from the love of God. Church, this is love. Let's pray. Father, gracious God, you have loved us with an everlasting love. You have sent your son to earth because you love us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you laid down your life willingly. You are one with the Father. His love and your love are one. In your death on the cross, we see this love. And in your resurrection, we see the love of the Father that he would not let you go. Jesus, we say, we say yes to you today. We want to, to let you love us. We want to, we want to be in Christ. We want to be in you so that the Holy Spirit can be in us and we can have that, that promise, that guarantee that you've given us. Come now, Holy Spirit. Bring your resurrection life in us and flow it out of us. Make our hearts that were dead in sin alive in, again in Christ. Stir us with new power to obey you and to love you wholly. Send us into the world with this new life. Fill us with the hope that one day we will know this resurrection life in its fullness. And I pray this over all our people. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Spend the time well with your family. Go in peace. See you later.